Good morning, church. I must be both a pastor and a dad because my favorite genes are the holy ones. Anyway, today I want to talk to you about Stephen. Well, not exactly about Stephen. What I want to do is I want to show you his sermon. Stephen was the first person to ever be killed for his faith in Jesus. And he is killed largely because of this sermon that he preaches that attacks the people of the religious establishment of his day too closely. So they can't put up with it, so they kill him. I want to take you to that, but before I take you to his sermon, I have to give you just a little bit of background. I'm not going to go into all the background of Stephen, but you need to know the background of the Israel people with regard to where they were putting their hope. You see, you and I would think that they were putting their hope in God. And in a sense, that's right. But it's not exactly right, because you see, they tied God together with three of God's promises. Three things that God had given to them that then they began to realize were the thing they could rely on. They were relying on the things God gave them, not on the God behind them. And the three things they were relying on were the land, the law, and the temple. Each one of these things was a symbol of how God was especially working with the people of Israel. God had promised them the land, and they now were living in the land. God had given them the law, and they were now following the law, or trying to. At least some of them were really trying to follow the law. And then God had given them a temple, and the temple was the symbol of God's dwelling on earth. The temple was supposed to hold the Ark of the Covenant. The temple was supposed to be the place where the sacrifices were done. And so the land, the law, and the temple were these three very clear symbols of God's work with the people of Israel. And so if they didn't have those three things, then they felt like they didn't have God. But if they had those three things, they felt like they had God. Anyway, Stephen is challenged to speak about his faith, and he stands up and he begins to directly attack each of these three things that they loved so much. In other words, Stephen is attacking where they were putting their hope. Take a look at this, Acts chapter 7, verse 2. To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. This is an important verse for the people of Israel because this verse demonstrates that God wanted the people to be living in Israel, in that land over there, the land of Canaan, the promised land. Because wasn't that land holy? Well, actually, this is interesting. Stephen's very first claim is that God meets Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he even went to Haran, which was way before he went to the land of Canaan. In other words, God met Abraham in a different land. Verse 4, it says, So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on, but God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. This is Stephen saying that, yeah, God did promise this land, but not even Abraham had a real inheritance here. It was a future promise. The land wasn't special. The promise was special. He doesn't go into the details about all that, but, you know, it's important that Stephen is giving these statements to, as kind of a, a, a quiet dig to the way the Jewish people were believing at the time. Let's keep reading, but let's skip over to verse 9. It says, Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. Then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan bringing great suffering, and our ancestors could not find food. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. After this, Joseph sent for his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. Then Jacob went down to Egypt, where he and our ancestors died. 
Now, if you're a person who doesn't like Bible history, what I just read sounds just like Bible history. And you're like, what is the difference? What, does, what difference does this make in my life today? Let me tell you, God's blessing clearly happened in Egypt. The patriarchs were jealous of Joseph. They sold him as a slave. He went to Egypt. That's where Joseph was blessed. Then because of a famine that hit the promised land, all of these people went down to Egypt. And that's where they received their blessing. God was caring for the people in the foreign land of Egypt. In other words, God's blessing didn't happen in the right land. It happened in a foreign land. But there's another dig that Stephen throws in there. Just another one where if you paid attention, you would have noticed the brothers were jealous of Joseph. They sold him as a slave. They rejected him. But he was God's chosen one to bring about the salvation of God's people. In other words, the one who would bring about salvation is the one that all the rest of them rejected. Now, you might not have picked up on that, but I think the Israelite leaders did. Anyway, let's skip to verse 23. Verse 23, when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian. So he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard this, he fled to Midian where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. Keep going. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. Again, God showed up, but it wasn't in the right land. Now it wasn't even in Egypt. God showed up in the land of Midian. Again, God showed up in the wrong place. And again, God chose a leader that everybody else rejected. Hopefully you're beginning to pick up on what's happening here. Skip ahead, verse 35. It says, this is the same Moses they had rejected with the words, who made you ruler and judge? He was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This is the Moses, verse 37 who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our ancestors, and he received the living words to pass on to us, but our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. Here's Stephen. He says, okay, you put your hope in this land, but all of God's blessings have come in locations that were not this land. Okay, you put your hope in the law. Well, the law came through Moses and all of the ancient people rejected Moses. They didn't just reject Moses, they also rejected his law when they put together this golden calf and decided they were going to worship it. They rejected Moses, they rejected the law, the land wasn't even God's place of blessing. So what about the temple? Check this out, verse 44. Our ancestors had the tabernacle of the covenant law with them in the wilderness. It had been made as God directed Moses according to the pattern he had seen. After receiving the tabernacle, our ancestors under Joshua brought it with them when they took the land from the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David who enjoyed God's favor and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Again, this sounds like history, but pay attention to the details because what's going on here is Stephen is saying, okay, we had a portable temple for a long time. It was just fine. Then David said, I want to make a real temple. But God said, sure, but not you. We'll let someone else do that. And then Solomon was the one who finally built a house for God. Verse 48, however, the Most High does not live in houses 
made by human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? <laughs> yeah, what Stephen is saying is that the temple has never been a thing to trust. They put their hope in the land, but God's greatest blessings came from elsewhere. They put their hope in the law, but even God's greatest law-giving leader had been rejected by them. And the law that he brought, they had already failed to keep. And they put their hope in the temple. But the temple was never a place where was, it was really God's true home. His original home was this portable tabernacle thing, and then they built this permanent dwelling place, but even that was never really a thing to trust. Stephen finally just points his finger at them, and he says this, You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. In other words, you're not even real Jews in the way you're behaving. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, and now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who've received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. And that's when they declared, that it was time to kill him, and they did. My question for you is simple. Where are you placing your hope these days? Where is your hope? Is your hope in the land? We could say the land is a symbol of God's blessing. God makes a promise, he keeps the promise. That's what he did for the land back then. The land is a symbol of God's blessing. Are you putting your hope in God's blessing? Well, guess what? God's greatest blessings come through the experiences of exile, come through the appearance of exile. A lot of times we put our hope in our blessing, and then when the blessing begins to fade away, we're like, where is God? And yet we don't realize that God's greatest blessings came in Egypt and Mesopotamia and Haran and even Babylon. Are you putting your hope in God's blessings? God's greatest real blessings come from those places where we don't feel the blessing. Are you putting your hope in the law or, in other words, your own obedience? God says this, and so I'm going to follow his will. I'm going to obey him uh, as much as I possibly can religiously. Guess what? You've been rejecting God's word forever. And other people have been rejecting God's word forever. And God still forgives and God still reaches out. So if you're putting your hope in your own, in your own obedience, and if you're putting your hope in the law, then that's not even the thing that's going to bring you God's forgiveness anyway. Are you putting your hope in some leader, past or present? Listen, people have always rejected God's leaders. Maybe even you, for a time, were rejecting God's leadership in your life. The leaders are out there, but your perception of those leaders isn't necessarily something you can trust. Or the temple. Are you trusting in the temple? What does that mean for you and me? It means some location, some place, some experience where God is supposed to be. Well, guess what? God has never lived in people's houses. God has never lived in some building. God has never lived in some experience. Anything that we could point to that's a temple of God, he has never chosen to live in. They were just symbols. Are you putting your trust in a temple? In one of those symbols, God's never lived there. See, God's greatest leaders have always found God when they were exiled and alone and separated from all of the symbols of God. Abraham was in Mesopotamia. Jacob was in the wilderness after he fled from his brother Esau. Joseph was in Egypt Moses was in Midian. David was on the run from Saul. Elijah was hiding in a cave. Daniel was out in Babylon. And even Jesus wandered in the wilderness. The greatest leaders of God have always had their greatest experiences of God when they were exiled and alone 
and away from all the symbols. What about you? Stephen says that people always resist the Holy Spirit. And I think it's because we resist the Holy Spirit. I think we resist the Holy Spirit because we are looking for God in all the wrong places. We are looking for God in the blessings. We're looking for God in the obedience. We're looking for God in the symbols. And Stephen says, in your focus on the law, the land, and the temple, you have missed the righteous one who's right there in front of you the whole time. You've missed the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. Listen, we are all going through some weird times right now, and to you it might feel like exile. To you it might feel like you're being alone. To you it might feel like all kinds of different things. Maybe it's boiling down into a place of impatience or whatever. All I know is that we have always rejected the Holy Spirit's work because we have always been looking for God in the wrong places. We have always been putting our hope in the wrong places. And today, today is your day to stop that incorrect hope Today is your day to open yourself to the Holy Spirit and say, God, where are you in this? God, what are you doing in this? I have put my hope and my trust in so many things. I've put it in your blessings. I've put it in your law. I've put it in your symbols. But today, I just want you. Show me you in the midst of my now. And in so doing, I believe just maybe you'll encounter God the way he wants to be found. Let me pray for you. Our Heavenly Father, we recognize that we are people who resist you and reject you so often because we are looking for you in a place that makes sense to us rather than looking for you where you might be. Father, would you reveal yourself to us today and help us to fall more in love with you as we do. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today, stop looking for God in all the wrong places and start finding him where he is. God bless you.